Okay, well, uh, thank you so much, Gerald. Thank you for, uh, again, the opportunity to uh, reach our audience and uh, colleagues uh, with respect to uh, another interesting topic in the materials and polymers world, stimuli, responsive polymers, and uh, nanomaterials. So, uh, again, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening uh, to all of you you and uh, whichever part of the world uh, you are. Uh, I believe uh, the, the webinar is, of course, accessible to anyone with a laptop and a, a strong uh, uh, internet connection. So um, let me uh, start by uh, introducing um, Case Western Reserve University. Um, we are located in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, home of the Cleveland Orchestra and Cleveland uh, Museum of Art. We are located at uh, the heart of the cultural district, not far from uh, uh, downtown as well. Uh, Case Western Reserve University is home also to Thinkbox. This is our institute uh, for innovation in rapid prototyping, additive manufacturing, and uh, for short, some of you know this as uh, 3D printing. Uh, we are located at uh, the Kent Hale Smith Building, uh, at home of the Department of Macro Molecular Science Engineering. And so if you have an opportunity to visit us, just uh, let me know. Uh, so as far as uh, research is concerned, you may think of our group as focusing at materials at interfaces or, or uh, chemistry at interfaces. And this is represented by uh, a number of publications and even cover pages we've had uh, through the years. On the other hand, the other uh, phase we have as a group is we work with several companies, uh, different types of uh, projects related to uh, research and product development, and we're very familiar with, uh, with projects uh, related to uh, um, development as well as uh, improvement and enhancement of properties. Uh, to uh, help the company uh, produce better products. Also, uh, we are home to Petroplates. We established this uh, um, consortium to work with the oil and gas industry. And uh, we have a number of projects to enhance uh, productivity as well as development of new materials. Uh, and then lastly, I'd uh, like to uh, uh, promote to you the Coatings Conference we will have uh, this May uh, in Texas, um, Advanced Coatings, and the website is there. Uh, I feel free, uh, free to explore, uh, or you can be, ask me questions as uh, one of the co-organizers. All right, so formally I'd like to start our uh, session. Uh, when we think about nanostructured materials, we think about scale and structuring from two directions, what we call bottom-up, and top to bottom. Bottom up means we start with building blocks, which we can then structure uh, to form a pattern or uh, a template. On the other hand, we can do what we call a top to bottom approach, uh, similar to lithography, where we can take a bulk material or film and uh, develop the uh, topo uh, topographical order or uh, pattern. So nanostructuring means you're able to use uh, these two approaches. Now, polymers are integral uh, to nanotechnology in that, as you can see here, it goes towards structuring of surfaces to form grafted polymer systems to uh, hierarchical films uh, to stimuli responsive uh, materials, as we're going to talk about uh, uh, today, uh, all the way to utilizing Polymers are surfactants or components of colloidal particles or uh, interactions. So you can see here the rich chemistry that one can access uh, through um, knowledge of polymer science and, of course, design and synthesis. Uh, here is but another um, diagram which shows the order of uh, what we call polymer brushes and uh, uh, grafted polymer systems in that we can use stimuli, uh, either as particles or grafted polymers, uh, in which case uh, these two review articles uh, shows that 
as a stimuli responsive material. This can be driven by transport, uh, by changes uh, in the morphology, working behavior, cross-linking uh, with the corresponding um, uh, stimuli that's provided by a change in pH, temperature, chemical gradient, uh, uh, photoactivity, and so on. Uh, in fact, uh, you will see today a lot of work we've done done on polymer brushes or grafted polymer system to uh, see that stimuli response. Uh, this can lead to, as, as uh, I described earlier, changes in either the film composition or even the micellization or colloidal phenomena of polymer material components. Uh, so for example, uh, several years ago, we pioneered a lot of techniques on grafted polymer systems. Uh, where we enter polymers uh, to surfaces either by the grafting to, grafting through, or grafting from methods, where we can use the stimuli to change the response of the polymer towards wetting, swelling, patterning, or uh, the ability for sensing as well. So I will be showing several examples that we've demonstrated this on surfaces. So first, let's talk about the lotus effect. Some of you may be familiar with super hydrophobic coatings being facilitated by a hierarchical structure utilizing the Cassie-Baxter phenomena of trapped air, controlled hierarchical roughness, and of course surface energy. And this is used to explain many things that are observed in nature from the lotus leaf to insect strider to different types of non-wetting phenomena in uh, mammalian hair and feather. Actually, back in 20, uh, uh, as, as 2013, we have tried to capture some of this effect through what I call templated systems. This diagram actually shows what we did back then, where we mimic the surface of a lotus leaf using a PDMS mold, and then we utilize that PDMS mold to change the template or topography of a substrate, uh, such as cellulose acetate which we then modified with a polyelectrolyte that is capable of surface-initiated polymerization through ATRP, or leading free radical polymerization, with a, uh, a stimuli-responsive uh, polynipam. Polynipam, uh, a short uh, for poly and isopropyl acrylamide, as shown in this structure, is what we call a temperature-sensitive polymer with an LCST behavior or lower critical solution temperature. For short, what it does is that in the presence of hot water or higher temperature, it collapses uh, to a hydrophobic state. But at lower temperatures, it is water swellable or soluble. Okay. So in this work, uh, we, as mentioned in this uh, diagram, we functionalize this lotus lit templated like surface uh, resulting in the grafting of a uh, polymer bilayer, up to 10 bilayers of a macro initiator for ATRP. So this macro initiator for ATRP is represented by this uh, uh, tertiary um, bromide active bromide group, which then serves as a radical for initiation of uh, ATRP under um, um, controlled equilibrium. Now, um, this diagram here, which represents what we call X-ray photon electron spectroscopy, a method for characterizing surfaces, simply shows that we were successful in modifying cellulose acetate with our initiator, and then finally by growing the polymer, or polynipam, as shown here by the big carbon peak uh, represented by the grafted polymer system. Uh, on the um, cellulose acetate. And this just shows the fine spectra that we utilize to monitor this grafting from uh, the um, cellulose acetate to the initiator and then finally the polynipam as represented by this big or large uh, uh, growth on the carbon carbon uh, backbone of polynipam. Now you may be interested more on this uh, micrograph which actually shows how it looks like. So once we have templated the um, 
um, cellulose acetate uh, with with the um, uh, mold silicon mold. This is how it looks like. So this is the original uh, picture for the lotus leaf. After we have uh, templated uh, the cellulose acetate with the silicon mold, this is a bigger picture of the uh, silicon mold. After we have grafted the polymer, I'm sorry, the cellulose acetate, after we have grafted the polymer. And this is actually how the polynipon looks like after we have structured the um, lotus leaf template. So actually, I can say that this is a lotus leaf um, this is an artificial lotus leaf uh, texture, okay? And we've simulated it, patterned it, and templated it. Uh, this um, spectrograph or chemical spectrograph uh, map shows how the uh, chemical species from the um, IR regions is represented by the um, cellulose acetate, and then the uh, grown polymer on top of it, which shows the distribution on this color image that 1750 that represents the polynipan uh, grafted. So uh, topographically and chemically, uh, this is how the stimuli responsive film looks like. But perhaps uh, another aspect of looking at the stimuli responsive behavior is through actual uh, presence of a temperature gradient or stimuli. So here, this is a representation of the poly 9 uh, uh, side group. So at lower temperatures, 25 degrees C, pretty much the uh, hydrogen bonding occurs between the anisopropyl acrylamide side chain and water. But when you heat it up, the interaction by hydrogen bonding becomes internal. In other words, it shuts off water and squeezes it out such that you have a more hydrophobic interaction. And it can be seen here by the um, wetting behavior. So just to distinguish this contact angle measurement, the, the flat surface, which has no pattern, shows that if we simply graph the polynipam without the uh, lotus leaf pattern, uh, you see a change from 60 to 90. It's actually quite good. It just shows the hydrophilic to hydrophobic with about 30 degrees difference. However, when we replicated the lotus leaf pattern with the same material, but with a template, you, you notice quickly here that we have a hydrophilic surface, but then when we heat it up, there's a whopping change of about 150 degrees on the contact angle. And this represents what the lotus leaf template does to a, a polynipam that's grafted on the polymer material. So this dramatic change uh, from uh, hydrophilic to super hydrophobic uh, occurs with a gradient of about 15 degrees C. And in fact, this is repeatable and scalable event. So here, in the contact angle is represented by what we observe on a flat film and a templated film where you have uh, this reversibility in heating, cooling, heating, cooling on the contact angle. So this is one of the most dramatic examples of a stimuli-responsive polymer brush. Uh, the date that we have published, and of course, you feel free to go to the, the paper and observe uh, or learn more about what we actually did. The uh, next system that I'd like to show to you is the importance of patterning and templating and how we are able to incorporate the stimuli responsiveness using a colloidal template. So in some of my previous talk, uh, I've shown this colloidal templating based on the use of um, colloids uh, of essentially emulsion polymerized polystyrene uh, that uh, are able to form a two-dimensional pattern that looks like this. And then once you try to electropolymerize, in this case, a polypro material on this pattern, we are able to create a honeycomb structure, a half dome, and a full dome. So this templating basically enables us to create these two-dimensional arrays made up of a conducting polymer that is uh, fused or even capsule-like in properties uh, as isolated in this uh, pictograph below. Um, so what we did is essentially try to see how we can incorporate thermally responsive polymers in these patterns using, again, the polynipan brush. So just to uh, go through this diagram, first is we prepare the colloidal pattern 
uh, uh, using a uh, the polystyrene microspheres, uh, nanosphere, 500 nanometer um, particles. We then electropolymerize around it. You do not see the change on the, the uh, uh, colloidal material itself, but uh, underneath these uh, templates actually have conducting polymers. And then once you remove the colloidal uh, template, uh, by THF or dissolution of the collagen up with the pattern underneath uh, this uh, colloidal particles as shown here. So these are actually conducting polymers of polycarbazole that was deposited by electropolymerization to give you this honeycomb structure. Uh, here's another representation by uh, 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 TEM imaging. So actually this is a as good as a way of highlighting the importance of atomic force microscopy in analyzing uh, these films. And later on, I'll show you in terms of stimuli responsiveness. So what we did is on those, uh, and these are all AFM pictographs, uh, we then functionalized the inner holes, uh, which is bare, uh, really bare as uh, uh, iodine oxide with ATR initiators using self-assembled monolayers. We then grew a polynipum brush inside those holes, and this AFM um, micrograph shows before and after that grafting. Uh, actually, an important uh, modification of the AFM, or conducting AFM, enables us to visualize the uh, differentiation in conducting and insulating properties of this material. So the green color here, using conducting AFM, uh, is electrically conductive, as shown by this IV curve. On the other hand, the inside of this uh, pattern template, which is your grafted polynipam, is not. It's insulating, and so we have this bluish color. So this is an example of the power of AFM in distinguishing patternings on morphologically distinct arrays. Actually, uh, what's interesting is that we made a mistake in that uh, serendipitously one of my students deposited too much polymer uh, shown here with polythylene on the colloidal template such that we ended up with a topology uh, that, did, uh, that looks like this. In fact, this is a hierarchical structure on top of the colloidal template which is shown uh, or you can perceive from this uh, uh, SEM um, micrograph has buried, being buried in this hierarchical structure. And a IR imaging, uh, another important imaging technique combined with chemical uh, mapping, uh, verify that we indeed have polythylene on the surface. <coughs> so what's interesting, and some of you might have seen this on some of my previous talks, is that that type of hierarchical morphology <coughs> is actually very good for producing a super hydrophobic effect, and not the colloidal template. So what we did is we simply monitored the changes on the uh, pattern and its wetting behavior. So if we simply have the polystyrene colloidal template on the surface, in fact, it is uh, hydrophilic, whereas uh, normally you'd expect in a thin, flat film of polystyrene, this would be hydrophobic. We actually observe a contact angle of 46. Uh, but without the polystyrene, uh, the polytypene that we prepared in the morphology it produces is actually quite hydrophobic. Uh, if we have um, uh, colloidal particles of 100 nanometer diameter buried on top of this uh, polytypene, we actually have a, a good hydrophobic surface. But what's surprising to us is when we actually look at that uh, rack morphology I showed earlier, that film is predisposed to give, giving a super hydrophobic surface. So the super hydrophobic surface here uh, is represented by a contact angle higher than 150. So definitely at 154, it is super hydrophobic. Now interestingly, when we change the ester to an acid, which will make it more hydrophilic, indeed uh, the material itself became hydrophilic from 102 to 32. But then when we put this material on top of the polystyrene particle, it actually produce a, a hydrophobic effect, quite hydrophobic as shown in a contact angle of 140. And then lastly, when we tried it with a 500 nanometer template uh, particle, it also showed 
a good uh, uh, hydrophobic or near super hydrophobic property. Now, uh, interestingly, these materials are super hydrophobic, but when you drop kerosene, oil, hexadecane, diiodomethane, methane, it simply soaks it up. It is a super lipophilic material. So this stimuli responsiveness means that uh, uh, at a certain order, it loves water, but at the same time, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, at a certain order, it loves oil, but it also hates water. Actually, since the polymer is what we call electrochromic, another stimuli response here is that we can change the voltage and it changes in color. So we can turn from red to green, red to green, simply by controlling the voltage from zero to one volt. Okay? And that's what we call electrochromic response. On the other hand, this color change is also accompanied by a change in morphology, which goes, gives you a super hydrophobic behavior to a hydrophilic behavior. And that means that you can switch back and forth zero to one volt, zero to one volt, and you can switch between a super hydrophobic, hydrophilic, orange to green color simultaneously. So this is a dual responsive material or pattern or, uh, as demonstrated in this material. All right, so let me switch this time to dendrimers systems. Uh, dendrimers are, are topologically direct hyperbranch materials that uh, we're missing are essentially macromolecules or polymers that in this case we have derivatized uh, uh, topologically and attach them to particles. Uh, we are, we're, we're quite good in it, uh, obviously, as shown by the number of publications we have done through the years. These are energy transfer, charge transfer, responsive dendrimers. I don't have much time to talk about this, but feel free to email me or look at some of these uh, uh, references. Actually, uh, we were fascinated with these materials because of their electronic properties. We've synthesized polythiophene or polythiophene with ruthenium cores or different types of branch systems that are electropolymerizable. Uh, but what's interesting in terms of their topology, and again, AFM is a quite an important technique for looking at their ordering behavior, is uh, to, to look at this pattern. We observed that, that this third thiophene dendrimers actually form hexagonally packed structures by itself, or itself assembles on a graphite uh, a surface in a very high order. And when they are left to themselves in very dilute solutions, they actually want to stack and form rods. So the same material at the different concentration, and we've played since with different topologies, topological structures actually give us rods. They like to form these rods or simply columns of these materials at the right surface, in this case, mica uh, versus graphite. Uh, since then, we've played around with dendrimers such as this. Uh, here, we have a dendrimer that has a carbazole group on the periphery. And these carbazole groups are electrochemically active such that when we electropolymerize them, in principle, you will have linking or even cross-linking of the carbazole units on the periphery. So this is represented by a flat surface. In reality, as a dendrimer, this is a globular structure, and it actually forms a globular crumpled structure as shown here. This was actually verified by atomic force microscopy. Again, another reason why we use the AFM, because it allows us to measure the change in dimension and height of these dendrimers on an IPO or a gold substrate after we've applied the voltage. So as shown here, the stimuli response after that uh, electrochemical potential or polymerization gives us a globular structure which is much more contracted and is shown as an increasing height by AFM. You may be curious how they appear in uh, structures that are spread at the air-water interface. They like to form globular structures as shown here. Uh, so actually, this is a very good use of a technique called atomic force microscopy, uh, LB film together with atomic force microscopy, where we can monitor the packing behavior of these dendrimers as we compress them or increase the surface pressure. So you can see here 
uh, from um, low surface pressure to high pressure we transition from particles to pearl necklace type of structures and in some instances we've seen spaghetti like behavior okay so again this is an interesting system of stimuli response in this case the stimuli is based on the change in surface pressure with the packing behavior of these dendrimers at the air water interface so I started this talk by directly giving you two examples of how we have manipulated polymers and applied stimuli response. I'd like to go on now and review to you some of the polymers and what do we mean by stimuli response. So stimuli means that you have an external field applied to the material, whether it is in solution, gel state, film state, and the corresponding change in the polymer behavior. To this, we can classify uh, solvent response, temperature response, pH response, electrical response, photoresponse, and others uh, that uh, is based on the change in the chemical or physical nature or ordering of the polymers. So to this, I'll give several examples uh, in different media. Uh, so for example, uh, I've shown you what the polymer brush can do yeah, in terms of temperature. Uh, one possibility and an obvious possibility is if you have a mixed brush, a binary brush, where one brush is selectively soluble to one solvent, you can cause that brush in this mixed brush system to swell, as represented by this red color brush. Or in a media in solution where you can change uh, a media from um, polar to nonpolar solvent or different dielectric constant. You can make, for example, this dendrimeric uh, material to swell uh, from the inside or outside. In other words, the outside peripheral groups are hydrophobic, more nonpolar, and the inside made up of more uh, polar structures. So you can switch back and forth, back and forth in terms of the swelling behavior or dimension of this material. Uh, another example, uh, which actually I did show you earlier already, is the LCST uh, behavior of, let's say, the poly nine prime material on a graphic polymer system and the corresponding change in the uh, contact angle. And here is another representation of what uh, uh, it shows in a polymer brush. So these two uh, pictographs are examples of uh, those systems that I showed earlier. Uh, one possibility is to use pH response. Now, pH response is observed with what we call weak uh, polyelectrolytes or weak electrolytes where it is pH sensitive. At a low pH, for example, the carboxylic acid group is acidic. Therefore, you have um, essentially carboxylic uh, acid group, and it is less swelled as shown here in a porous membrane structure. On the other hand, uh, by using a higher pH, you basically have the carboxylic acid in the carboxylate form, and it serves as a blocking mechanism. So in a poor behavior, you have an open valve and you have a closed valve, as represented here by a change in pH. So these are basically pH-responsive polymers. Uh, here, you have an electrically responsive polymer. One can look at uh, using, let's say, conducting polymers that I, I showed earlier on my uh, examples here. You have a representation of an electrochemical uh, responsive polymer based on the selective uh, hydrolysis and then oxidation reduction uh, to force the hydrophilic ionic group to bury inside closer to the interface. So this one, uh, hydrolysis results in a carboxylate group that is present on the surface. And if you go to a negative potential, you basically will force the end group, ionophilic end group, to bury itself on a high, uh, on the um, um, substrate or conducting substrate, and therefore you transition from a hydrophilic surface, water laving, to a hydrophobic surface by simply exposing the backbone of the polymer material. Uh, or in this case, uh, you have an alkaline or a simple 
self-assembled monolayer of the thio uh, alkyl uh, carboxylate derivative. Uh, a photoresponsive polymer uh, can be represented by this action. Essentially, uh, you can have a chemical structure uh, that transitions from an azobenzene cis to a transform. The significance of the azobenzene dye, which can be found uh, either as a surfactant or a polymer, means that you have a more non-polar azobenzene form in the transform to a more polar cis form. And therefore, this light-driven interaction from a trans to a cis form switches the solubility of this complex from toluene to water. And uh, this is the one of the easiest things you can do with azobenzene dyes. The other type of dye that is commonly used are the merocyanine spiropyran transitions. Uh, an example also here is in terms of phase transfer catalysis. Again, uh, you can have a polymer or you can have a dye that sw simply switches back and form from a organic soluble transform to a, uh, a polar water soluble cis form. Now apply this to other types of phase systems. Essentially, if I have a polymer or a micelle, I can switch it back and forth as follows. So for example, uh, if I have a unimer, then it micellizes to form this interaction. This could be representative of a black copolymer where it captures the uh, hydrophilic block in a water and oil em um, environment where basically the uh, black copolymer or surfactant here captures the water soluble fraction and then includes it in the core of the micelle. Or you can have a nanogel where the uh, nanogel you have you can have a hydrophilic core that is able to encapsulate um, ionophilic or uh, water soluble species and then collapse back and forth depending on the stimuli response and that can be driven by temperature or uh, other types of solvent environments. Uh, in fact, a Janus type of behavior can be observed with a mice cell or star copolymer core system where you have a dual brush composition of a hydrophilic or hydrophobic block. So uh, as a transition, let's say uh, as a function of concentration or temperature uh, towards the interface of oil and water, you can have this Janus-like behavior. Or uh, last, in this last example here, you can have the selective aggregation or agglomeration of a swellable to partial type of particle. Again, this can be driven by a function of temperature or pressure. So these are concepts of how you can control gels, micelles, and partial particles to have different phase transitions or behavior by applying the appropriate stimuli. Uh, so why not? Uh, core, shell, micelles, micelles, lamellar behavior is the realm of surfactants uh, and uh, even emulsions in an oil and water phase. So here I'm basically transitioning from flat films to that of micellar or colloidal phenomena. So this is a classical diagram of a phase behavior between a uh, surfactant, water, and oil phase diagram. It shows the different liquid crystalline phases or lithotropic phases that can be observed by changing the composition between these two media. Uh, so a micelle in a surfactant uh, uh, system, whether it's small molecule or black copolymer, shows the distribution of a hydrophilic block or a hydrophobic phobic block I, I, and either as a head or a tail group. And this can be governed also by the uh, volume or the uh, uh, ratio between the hydrophilic head group and the hydrophobic uh, tail. So this represents a general micellar behavior of a, let's say, a polymer, a block of polymer that will have this transition as a micelle uh, surfactant, a polymer surfactant, uh, where the ratio or the composition of the black copolymer can actually determine its 
swellability or volume. And this can be calculated actually using a critical volume parameter. Uh, I don't have that equation in the slides, but it's possible to predict their behavior using that formula. So other examples of micellar systems, which can be a function of the uh, um, block of polymer uh, head to tail ratio, can lead to micelles, to uh, vesicles, to lamellar systems, or in terms of emulsion, you can have uh, the presence of oil and water. And so what this represents is that you can actually have a phase diagram represented by these different liquid crystalline structures as a function of the um, copolymer ratio or even by changing the dilution of, uh, let's say, water or oil. Okay. So again, uh, lots of physical chemistry that can be gained from investigating either the changing composition or the structure of the black copolymer. So if that's not clear yet, uh, here again is a pictorial representation of a dye black copolymer. One block can be uh, oil-loving, lyophobic, uh, lyophilic, and then another block can be uh, oil-hating, uh, so lyophobic. Okay, just another play on the terms hydrophilic versus lyophilic. Uh, you can go from either oil side or water side. Uh, depending on the ratio, it's able to form uh, different types of star uh, versus particle type of geometries. And here you can vary the volume or the composition ratios to get, let's say, these two types of uh, behavior. Okay. So let me go forward. So another representation could be here, an oil and water or water and oil emulsion, okay. or micelle without oil. Okay. And these are very useful um, uh, entities for stabilization, use them as nanoreactors, swelling behavior, and so on. So we have a special term for polymers that have extended structures beyond micelles. We call them polymerosomes. So polymerosomes are basically vesicles, but instead of using small molecules or surfactants, we use that block of polymer. So we call them polymerosomes. One of the... Uh, um, uh, uh, popular reported ones are, are can be based on polybutadiene, which is your oil phase, and polyethylene oxide, which is your water phase. Uh, this uh, STEM micrograph simply shows how changing the ratio, a volume ratio of polybutadiene and polyethylene oxide will give you particle fiber versus polymerosome like behavior. And actually, these polymerosomes, you can actually track them based on changes in the property without looking at their uh, morphology by TEM. Simply, simply as a shift in permeability, stability, or fluidity. So typically, micelles or the critical micelle concentration can be observed by monitoring changes or break in the properties uh, as you transition from uh, lower to higher concentration, describing the transition on a critical mindset. But uh, uh, microscopy, whether it's uh, TEM or AFM, plays a very important role in observing these systems. Here is a uh, TEM example of a polystyrene poly for vinyl pyridine dye block of polymer with different ratios showing the different aggregation behavior. Or uh, here is another example of TEM based on um, block of polymers uh, of polystyrene and polyethylene oxide uh, forming a hollow shell or core shell type of behavior. Actually, uh, you can include a colloid and use these block of polymers to form core shell particles as shown in this uh, sequestered uh, inorganic nanoparticle with a block of polymer that can easily be visualized uh, by PEM. Uh, here's an example of a carbon nanotube that has been sequestered with a block of polymer or um, magnetic iron oxide nanoparticles that, again, have been sequestered by the block of polymers. Okay. Uh, so, again, uh, these are simply reviews of uh, how um, a critical micro concentration is observed uh, from monitoring that of uh, fluorescence, absorbance, okay, uh, one can use uh, these methods for getting CMC. Okay. 
Uh, here is an example of a micelle that has been formed. And in order to preserve this star-like structure, one can use photopolymerization to preserve the core. So in this case, uh, a surfactant macromonomer or large molecular monomer can be forced to form a micelle where the hydrophobic plaque reserves in the core with a acrylate uh, or, or metacrylate end group, which can be photopolymerized to form this material. Actually, many uh, investigators have done this, including the uh, Woolley Group, uh, now at Texas A&M, in forming what we call uh, canoodles, uh, or simply by uh, utilizing block of polymers and controlling their ability to cross-link either a core or a shell, uh, giving you this coarse shell or hollow shell uh, structures. So obviously the stimuli response here is based on changes on the concentration, solvent, or anything that causes the micellar response to form these micelles, but then to stabilize them, one would employ polymerization or cross-linking methods. Uh, here again is another example uh, you, if you have this block of polymer uh, that is complex, let's say, to a, uh, a polyelectrolyte or in this case a DNA type of interaction, let's say an oligo DNA with another block that complementary DNA, in the presence of cyclohexane, uh, it forms this um, uh, structure uh, where the inner group uh, has the DNA hybridized structure, and then by UV cross-linking, you will end up with um, a structure that stabilized, and uh, you can actually extract those DNA pairs uh, using another solvent. So this is, again, an interesting way of making particles uh, that can be cured, prepared, and then uh, used as a drug delivery method. Uh, my guess is because of the DNA or RNA uh, fragments that they incorporated during the mycelization process. Uh, so here you can see that polymerization is very important or cross-linking is very important for stabilizing micelles, preferably to form either core shell or hollow shell structures. Uh, hydrogen bonding can be utilized to stabilize these micelles. This can be in the form of, uh, let's say, a uh, donor acceptor pairing between a hydroxyl and an amine group in a micelle. And essentially, uh, this stabilization occur, occurs in a water and oil environment, the uh, hydrophilic phase, let's say, being inside uh, the micelle. Uh, okay, so micelle, uh, in this case, if it's uh, oil environment only, the core means that the hydrophilic grows uh, inside. And in an in a emulsion, you have an oil and water interaction. So all of these examples uh, basically points to possible application. So one possibility, of course, is drug delivery. Uh, preparation of this uh, lamellar, uh, core shell, hollow shell uh, systems means that you can use them for delivering, uh, let's, let's say, these model drugs or uh, other types of pro-drugs or even cancer drugs such as loxorubicin, where the controlled release can be affected by the loosening of this uh, hollow shell structure. Uh, another interesting uh, structure or application we've seen uh, with uh, this uh, micellized or stabilized structures are uh, for oil and gas uh, related applications, essentially utilizing this uh, uh, hollow shell, core shell, or micellized structures to deliver, let's say, um, corrosion inhibitors or scaling inhibitors for uh, oil and gas applications. So actually, uh, uh, with that, I, I don't have any conclusion slides except that I want to give some room uh, for our audience to ask more questions. And with that, I'd like to uh, uh, close the webinar uh, uh, phase and go to the question and answer phase. And uh, uh, thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you very much, Professor. So, as before, we will be moving into the question and answer portion of today's session. Um, there are none in the queue so far, so uh, please feel free to type them in using your questions or chat module. 
uh, and we'll wait a couple minutes for some to show up in the pipeline here. We'll answer them sequentially. Uh, while we're waiting for questions to be submitted, uh, a couple of announcements for the Nano Academy webinar series. Uh, for this series with Professor Vincula, the Nano Materials webinar series, our next two sessions will be in May and in June. Uh, next month on the 19th, we'll be taking a look at layer by layer nanostructured coatings. Again, that's on May 19. And then the following month on June 9th, uh, we'll be doing a deeper exploration into super hydrophobic coatings. Again, super hydrophobic coatings on June 9. Uh, our other series, Advanced Techniques in Electrochemistry with Professor Baker, uh, looks like it'll be canceled for this month. Professor Baker is uh, a little busy, so uh, he sends his regrets, but we'll be back in June for uh, his uh, scanning electrochemistry microscopy and scanning ion conductance microscopy probe lecture in May. Uh, again, that's a TBA date in May, uh, but he'll be moving it sometime next month. All right, so our first question has arrived for Professor Advincula, and this question reads, has there been any development for drug delivery systems utilizing stimuli-responsive polymers? Yeah, good, very good question, because um, uh, I, we, we are disclosing uh, some of the um, activities uh, and reviews I've done. Uh, uh, the easiest you can actually look at is in terms of uh, uh, commercially available polymers acceptable in this industry. Some of the stimuli-responsive uh, polymers for drug delivery are based on copolymers of polyethylene oxide, uh, where the trigger or the field response is due to a change in body temperature. And uh, a change in body temperature, so for example, normal to uh, somebody with fever, uh, results in release of that material. So you, you can guess that some of these polymers have LCSD response. Uh, another that I have seen are based on polymers that respond with near infrared light. Now, UV light, I, I demonstrated earlier with azobenzidine, that is uh, not um, currently or will not be a foreseeable uh, um, future available because UV uh, light is harmful, although locally uh, this can be used uh, to trigger response. So near-infrared light is harmless. It's transparent to the skin. So that means that a polymer with a near IR response, and I, I can mention several dyes uh, that are capable or uh, gold nanoparticles that are capable of uh, uh, resulting in uh, change in heat or temperature has been observed. Um, another uh, example uh, is based on uh, stimuli response coming from uh, gold nanoparticles with, uh, with polymers. So gold nanoparticles uh, in specific geometries and length scale is again sensitive to near infrared light. So you can imagine a polymer with a temperature response if you uh, irrigate it with near infrared light. This nanoparticle would generate heat. That heat is then used to trigger uh, the um, dissolution or uh, thermoresponsive response of the block of polymer. Uh, so uh, maybe the qu another question is, are they commercially available? Honestly, I cannot uh, speak of any specific company who's adopting that uh, on an FDA-approved basis, but I know of startup companies who have been uh, utilizing any of those modes for uh, drug delivery. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we now have two more questions. The first one reads, can we use PVA and PEG as polymers? Uh, PVA, uh, poly um, vinyl acetate, and PEG is polyethylene glycol. So PEG is a kind of hydrogel uh, that is uh, also responsive to swelling uh, behavior, uh, both temperature and solvent effects. Uh, uh, can you uh, repeat, Gerald, the first polymer that you mentioned? 
to PVA? That's right. Uh, PVA, that's uh, Papa Victor Alpha, and then uh, PEG was Papa Echo Golf. Okay, so I'm just uh, guessing here because of common trade name abbreviation, PVA would be polyvinyl acetate. Um, oh, uh, just a moment, Professor. Um, actually, the, uh, the question uh, asker clarified, he's mentioning PVA as polyvinyl alcohol. Oh, polyvinyl alcohol. All right, uh, they're not far from polyvinyl acetate. So polyvinyl acetate is the uh, um, hydrolyzed derivatives. We, we call polyvinyl alcohol PVOH. So polyvinyl alcohol, yes, that is a uh, polymer that can uh, imbue the hydrophilic characteristics and is also uh, ingredient in some hydrogel formulations. So in the case of hydrogels, uh, this can be made stimuli responsive by both the uh, solvent as well as temperature, but more, uh, more interestingly with PVOH, it is responsive to the presence of ions. So you can have uh, uh, in the presence of iron such as iron plus three uh, or calcium resulting in chelation or precipitation or physical crosslinks. So in this case, uh, one would play with both temperature as well as uh, ionic uh, environment to change the gelation behavior, let's say, of a combination of these two materials. Thank you. And we have one more question here, or actually a pair of questions um, that, that are related. The first part reads, could you please elaborate a little more on the stimuli responsive polymers used in oil recovery? And is it something that we could expect to see being utilized in the near future? All right, so I can answer these questions as follows. Of course, everybody is concerned with price, cost. These days, uh, are pretty much in a very uh, squeezed environment. Uh, the oil and gas industry have largely been dependent on uh, utilizing polymers such as polyacrylamide or santan gum, guar. Uh, those uh, polysaccharide-based uh, polymers. So what are possible stimuli responsive polymers? Actually, um, uh, this will come from polymeric additives that have been used not only for um, inhibitors, uh, either corrosion or scaling, but also for um, perhaps uh, enhanced oil recovery or even uh, as completion um, fluids. So completion fluids means that uh, these are polymers that uh, are able, let's say, to form good micellar or nanoemulsion properties. Uh, without naming some of these polymers direct, directly uh, uh, because of some proprietary reasons, uh, we, we have worked on some block copolymers that enhance the formation of nanoemulsions um, towards uh, uh, in, in, increasing or changing the viscosity of a completion fluid at a particular temperature. A, uh, a, third, a second example I, I mentioned about enhanced oil recovery. Uh, some of these are based on polymer surfactant interactions. So surfactants uh, are used uh, as well as polymers separately for polymer flooding uh, or, or chemical flooding. Uh, we have worked with a combination of a surfactant and a polymer uh, uh, formulation that are temperature sensitive as well as uh, sensitive to uh, the presence of CO2. Okay. Uh, the third example, which is for inhibitors, is basically using polymeric uh, surfactants that are capable of... Uh, breaking the stability of the micelle uh, with a particular um, pH environment. Uh, so in this case, uh, more acidic or more basic pH, one can control the release of a corrosion inhibitor. Hopefully, uh, that concept, and we're, we're developing one right now, works under a variety of acidic conditions because most of the downhill condition, especially with the high CO2 or HDS condition, uh, can have this effect. Now, I, I can uh, uh, give, uh, for example, some clue on the molecular weight range 
that we uh, use as inhibitors uh, are released. These are typically low molecular weight uh, polymeric surfactants. Uh, without naming in general some of these structures, um, and I, I think they're present in pattern literature anyway. Uh, some of these structures have weak carboxylic acid uh, blocks, and then the other will have uh, polyacrylamide uh, blocks. So these are uh, combinations of uh, polyacrylamide derivatives that are blocky or surfactant in nature. Excellent. And it looks like we have one more question in the pipeline, and this one reads, uh, in regards to stimuli responsive polymers, uh, can they be used in electrode separators that are, um, that are in lithium ion batteries? Uh, yeah, very good question there. Uh, so usually uh, you go by the flux and the density of that separation. Uh, a favorite material out there is Nafion. Uh, I've seen in literature where they have utilized uh, conducting polymers or blocks of conducting polymers where one is electrochemically active and the other uh, block is ionophilic or uh, uh, ionically conductive. So the electrochemical conductive part would be an electroconducting polymer and by itself it also changes in its ionophilicity from oxidized to reduced form can be triggered to us uh, have a certain uh, wettability or morphology uh, when uh, uh, cycle between oxidized to um, reduced state. On the other hand, the ionophilic block, which is impervious to the redox states, remains uh, ionophilic. So let's say in a separator, one can conceive of a block copolymer or a blocky like copolymer composition in which one is responsive to voltage change, uh, whereas the ionophilic block uh, is able to let ion transport mechanism proceed uh, without uh, uh, much, we proceed uh, independent of the reducer oxidized state. So in this two-part uh, stimuli responsive system, you basically have uh, control on the separator function based on the reduce or oxidized state of the conducting polymer block. Okay, perfect. So we are now in the closing minutes of the session for today. Uh, one thing that I would like to point out for everyone who's remained with us to the end is, uh, first off, thank you. Uh, the other thing is in the chat module, I've sent to the entire audience the link to uh, the repository on Nano Academy um, for all of the lectures that Professor Advincula and other speakers have done for us throughout the past year. Uh, they're all up on YouTube, actually, on the Park Systems uh, YouTube channel. But you can see embedded links at parkafm.com, and a link has been sent to the chat. If you have any questions at all about the uh, webinar series, its structure, its content, maybe topics you'd like to see discussed in the future, uh, my direct email address is gerald at parkafm.com. I'm definitely open to hearing all of your guys' feedback, uh, so you can email me there. And, uh, Professor, if you could throw up your uh, title slide again, um, if you have any questions about uh, the content that was discussed today, stimuli responsive polymers, uh, you can reach the professor directly again there. His group's uh, website address is rcapoly.net. And you can reach him uh, at rca41 at case.edu. Uh, I see that um, no questions have, uh, have been added to the pipeline here. So uh, I believe that's all that we have for today. Any closing thoughts, Professor? Well, again, I'd like to thank our audience for uh, their uh, interest. Uh, some of those who have been attending regularly, their uh, faithfulness in following this series. and. Uh, Appreciate also Park AFM, uh, the opportunity to conduct this webinar uh, to the scientific community. Definitely. And for everyone still here, if you have any colleagues or any students or anyone who else who you think might be interested in the content of these webinars, definitely feel free to pass uh, the registration link uh, that you receive uh, to, your, to them. Uh, these webinars are all free to watch. And again, they're all archived on our YouTube channel and also on parkafm.com.
So on behalf of everyone here from Park Systems, as well as again from uh, on behalf of Professor Advincula, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, we hope to see you again soon next month for our next installment of the Nanomaterials webinar series. Have a great day, everyone.